The incumbent is Sheriff Rob Blair. The challenger is Davy Jones. We'll ask each of you to ask, uh, lead off with an opening statement of about two minutes of uh, length, and then we'll come back, circle around, rotate the order for the closing statement of equal length. In between, questions will be asked by Bill Stubblefield and John Gilstrap. Try to keep your answers to about two minutes, gentlemen. Uh, if one of you invokes the name of the other as part of your answer, the other Appreciate that. Um, as you said, I'm, I'm the incumbent. Uh, I was appointed on January 18th uh, to fill out the uh, uh, vacant term for sheriff. Uh, it was a unanimous, unanimous decision by the county commission. Uh, I'm honored to be serving as your sheriff. Um, I've uh, been in this position now three months. I'm learning a lot. Um, I'm learning that we have some great deputies uh, in Berkeley County, some great command staff um, at Berkeley County. Sheriff's Department. Um, a little bit of history about me. I'm, um, I'm a 25 year veteran of the West Virginia State Police. Uh, 18 of those years I spent with the West Virginia State Police was in management, uh, supervision, and um, I supervised over 100 personnel during that time, both uniform and um, civilian personnel. I retired in 2013 and went to work with the West Virginia Insurance Commission, not as a law enforcement officer, but working with law enforcement. So I have 35 years working in law enforcement in this community. This community is uh, very special to me. Um, uh, I married a, a local girl, Mary Beth Kisner. Her father was sheriff for eight years in the 80s here in Berkeley County. Uh, she's a small business owner. Uh, the, the heartbeat of the, any community, small, for 33 years she's owned her business here in Berkeley County. We raised three children here in Berkeley County. Uh, now I get the pleasure of watching my two grandchildren uh, grow up here in Berkeley County. So I love Berkeley County. Berkeley County is home. Um, I, I, I love what I do. I'm really enjoying this, uh, this job as, as sheriff, as your sheriff. And I'm, I'm just asking that uh, the voters uh, give me a chance for four more years as the Berkeley County Sheriff. Thank you, Sheriff Blair. Davy Jones. I'm Davy Jones. I want to thank uh, TV10 and Stumblefield Institute for having us here because it's always good to inform the voters of the candidates so they can make educated decisions. Army veteran, former uh, reserve deputy, and uh, and been in IT for about 30 years. I've run IT departments uh, for the Secretary of State, big budgets. And you have to think outside the box when you uh, are limited to your budget, obviously. Uh, my family, both my grandfathers were coal miners. Uh, they mined coals. And they, we just had uh, the governor candidates only talked about coal in West Virginia. My, both my granddads gave their lives for coal. They wound up dying of black lung and went to coal mines where they were shut down. Me and my wife, we live in the woods uh, in, the, in the panhandle here. And as a reserve deputy, I uh, volunteered hundreds of hours a year to the county, and that's volunteer, uh, so that we don't, the taxpayers don't actually have to pay us for the work that we do. And that's how I've led my life, life and service. I'm a constitutionalist, and as your next sheriff, I would prioritize defending your constitutional rights. Thank you. Thank you, Davy Jones. Uh, John Gilstrap will begin the questions. Before we get to that, we're going to take a three-minute timeout. We'll be right back with the first round of questions as our candidate form continues. When you are looking for the perfect gift, Look no further than L.A. Roberts Jewelers at 146 North Queen Street in downtown Martinsburg. Choose from a huge selection of unique items from the finest diamonds that make your eyes sparkle to exquisite timepieces, figurines, and collectibles. Buying from L.A. Roberts Jewelers means that you've made the decision to do business with people who've excelled in the industry for more than 100 years. They'll be here tomorrow when you need them, and if you need your jewelry or your watch repaired, they'll do that too. L.A. Roberts in downtown Martinsburg. Old World Jewelers for a new age. One of the questions lawyers get asked the most is, what is my case worth? I'm Steven Skinner and this is my brother Andrew with Skinner Accident and Injury Lawyers. The truth is, it's very difficult for a lawyer to pinpoint a number because every case is different. 
We get to know each situation and we'll give you an idea of what your case is worth and why. The sooner we get involved, the better we can do getting you the compensation you deserve. Google Skinner Lawyers or go to SkinnerWins.com. We'll treat you like family. Meet Paul Espinosa, a dedicated servant to our values and future. Espinosa spearheaded one of the nation's most powerful pro-life laws, protecting the innocent and upholding our values. Under his leadership, West Virginia saw the largest tax cut in its history and the elimination of the state tax on Social Security benefits. Paul has been a champion for student-centered education, helping ensure parents and students have the freedom to choose their own path. For a brighter future, vote Paul Espinosa. Paid for by Espinosa for Senate Mary C. Espinosa Treasurer. Qualifications matter, and that's why we need Carmela Cesare as our next family court judge. For 30 years, Carmela has fought tirelessly in our courtrooms, keeping our children safe and our streets free from violence. As family court judge, Carmela pledges to safeguard our children's welfare, ensure fair and balanced decisions, and serve our community's interests with integrity and dedication. This May, vote for qualifications and experience. Vote Carmela Cesare for family court judge. Paid for by the committee to elect Carmela Cesare for family court judge. Candidates for Sheriff John Gilstrap. Well, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, we'll start with Davey. A sheriff enjoys a high degree of discretion with the job. If a law were passed with which you did not personally agree, would you enforce it? Oh, absolutely. But personal, personally agree on something doesn't come into it. Now, if you're trying to refer to a constitutional uh, argument, then I would have to... Say a gun-related law. Right, that would violate the Second Amendment, because as we know, the Second Amendment clearly states, right, shall not infringe. And David, could you move closer to your sure. microphone? So shall not infringe is pretty clear. So if you, if you think and you look at that as an administrator and you say, wait, wait a minute, this might be a constitutional conflict. Well, do you enforce it? Well, you got to enforce the law. It's your job. But what you do is you do your due diligence and you go to your attorneys and you go to, to whoever your advisors are and you say, what do we do with this and how do we enforce this law? Because this is violating somebody's constitutional rights. As we all know, shall not infringe means shall not infringe. This is West Virginia. How many people have guns? Probably everybody. How many people have more than one gun? Probably everybody. And, and that's my take on constitutionally. Sheriff Blair. Could you repeat the question? Um, given the um, amount of discretion that a sheriff has, if, if a law were passed, in this case we're talking about like gun seizures, uh, if a law were passed that you personally disagreed with, would you go ahead and enforce it? hypothetical question it is a hypothetical talking about question like red flag laws. yes uh, obviously thank god west virginia we don't have those um i think there's other ways that we need to address you know mental health crisis in in, in our society um i am a constitutional carry advocate uh i think uh, that's everyone's right uh we're looking at um uh, a society where we're opening borders to people we don't even know, and that's going to come. That's going to flow down to sheriff's departments, and um, and throughout the nation, and uh, to uh, restrict people's rights to defend themselves. I'm I'm 100 percent against that. But the laws are up to the legislature to pass. I understand that, and then we have a court system to determine whether or not they're constitutional. Um, I will abide by what court rulings are, but. Uh, I think we need to really take a hard look at these laws that we're going to um, uh, start pushing in this country about taking people's uh, rights to, to care. I, I'm assuming that's where you're going with that. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I will enforce what laws are on the books um, and uh, what laws are constitutional. All right. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll start with Sheriff Blair on this. Homeless encampments exist throughout the county. Uh, what should we do about them? That's a really deep question. Um, uh, I think uh, what I've said to our deputies going uh, when I when I began that um, no matter who you're dealing with out here in society, you look treat people with empathy, treat people with compassion. Um, these homeless encampments, as far as uh, a sheriff's department's role is, uh, come along with uh, an element of crime uh, that we have to deal with. Uh, again, I go back to mental health uh, issues. I think um, I think we're lacking in that area um, uh, to provide mental health uh, for people that may be, be in that situation. 
I think our community, our churches, uh, partner with our churches to try to help these individuals get a hand up, not a hand out. Um, but, um, you know, as, as a sheriff's department, if someone calls and complains about, you know, someone on private property, then we're going to have to respond to that and, and act accordingly within the law um, and uh, try to find them resources. There's resources to help people out here. Um, there's the, you know, the, the men's shelter. There's other places that people can go. But, unfortunately, some people choose to do, live like this. And um, I, I'm all for uh, trying to help individuals find their way uh, to a better place. I think everyone deserves that. Um, and um, I don't know that there's an easy answer for that one. Mr. Jones? That is a very deep and complex question. Uh, we should always treat each other with respect. Uh, now, if there's a criminal aspect to it, you know, it's the department's job to deal with the criminality issue. But, uh, you know, we have to deal with the human element as well. Right. The, the problem in this country is we've stopped respecting each other, stopped having empathy. You know, we, all, we always want to play it by the book, and nothing's black and white, as we know. You know, as, as sheriff, I would partner with DHHR in these instances, because there are a lot of programs out there uh, that they may not even know that are available to them. And partnering with DHHR and having a contact there, and so that the deputies would go out there and respond to a situation if there's excuse me, if there's no criminality involved, then we can contact somebody at DHHR, you know, and have them come out and assist. John? All right. Um, given the, the job of a sheriff, why is it a partisan race? Why is it a Democrat versus Republican? Um, I believe you... I you I, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I lost track, so that would be... Uh, Danny. Start. Danny. That's a good question. Why is anything a partisan race? My, I think everybody should vote for a candidate based on research and ideology, but it is a partisan race. And when it becomes a partisan race, you have to back your party, no matter who the candidate is that's chosen by the voters, because you disrespect the voters if you don't. But it really shouldn't be. I don't think any race should be a partisan. But is there, is there a Republican platform for sheriff that would be different than a Democratic platform for sheriff? I can just tell you that a Republican platform is simply conservative. Uh, you know, does it trickle down to law enforcement? Probably not much. So the sheriff race should be a lot like judicial races, you know, because you really need to be impartial and you need to be in the middle. You know, you can't you can't allow uh, your ideology to disrespect someone with, with a different ideology. Uh, it, but again, that's the, that's the, legislate, the legislature's job on, on changing that kind of a race. Mr. Blair. I would be an advocate of nonpartisan um, sheriff's race. I, I think uh, you should vote for the person. Um, and. Um, as you said, there, there is a difference between parties as far as law enforcement goes. Um, we, we look the past four years, you look at what party was for defund the police. You know, it's a national. Thank God it's really not here in our community. But that's an absolute asinine uh, idea that we would want to defund the police. We see, we see the effects of that now. I said it back then. We see the effects of that now. Um, and uh, as, a, as a Republican conservative, I just find that offensive to me. I've been a, a lifelong law enforcement officer. My dad, 27 years in the state police. My uncles, Capitol Hill police officers. And then you sit here and watch the TV and watch this stuff about defund the police. And uh, we're not perfect. Police officers are not perfect. Uh, we're, we're part of the community. People fail to realize that sometimes. So, you know, to, to say that um, this should be a partisan I don't, I don't think it should be. I think you should look at the person. You should look at the person, look at their life history, look at what they've done for their community, how, the, how they serve the community. Um, I, I just, I, I find it, you know, I am a Republican. I am a conservative. Uh, that, that's my values that I hold dear, and that's, you know, how I will, how I will serve as your sheriff. Let me follow up on uh, to some degree what uh, uh, John just asked. Uh, every elected position in the county 
is unlimited as far as terms. With the exception of the sheriff. The sheriff has two four-year terms. Is that appropriate? And I'll start with you, Sheriff Blair. It's a good question. Um, as you look across the nation, I don't think that's, that's uh, uh, common now. I think sheriffs can run unlimited terms. And I think that goes back to um, the, the days of when you had a lot of corruption in southern West Virginia. I'm a southern West Virginia guy, so don't hold that against me. Uh, but I think it, that's where that came into play, to, to, to keep the corruption in check. Um, I think now in, in, in modern history, I think uh, maybe we should look at that and, and think uh, uh, in terms of if you have someone that's doing a good job as sheriff, why would you want to, in my instance, right now, I'm, I'm serving out a term, and unfortunately um, it counts as a term. So I, I've got hopefully four more years to serve in this position. And uh, I've said I want to leave it better than I found it. Um, four years is not a lot of time. Uh, but if you're have, if you have a sheriff that's doing really good and the voters want to continue that, I think uh, that would be, that would be um, something we should look at. The legislature should look at that. The people should look at that. Um, I would be for that. Um, but uh, that's a very good question. Mr. Jones? Well, that is a good question, uh, and I I'm a firm believer of term limits. So I'm going to go the opposite here with my opponent. And the, too much too much power for too much time is just too much. Uh, there's plenty of people out there that should step up and serve. Um, and if a prior sheriff is doing something well, then they should continue that practice. But I think everything should have term limits. I don't think anybody should be able uh, to, to have monopolize a particular office in any kind of way uh, for a long period of time. Uh, and I believe with, I don't know, I think the, legi the way the legislation is written, it's consecutive terms for sheriff in the state of West Virginia. So if you served two terms and you had a break of a term, I think you can serve again. And for uh, as a follow-up, that is a constitutional uh, constitutional requirement. And there was a referendum about ten years or so ago to remove this this limit, but it, it failed quite remarkably. So, John. All right, <clears throat> I want to go back to another hypothetical. Kind of get into your philosophy of policing, and I think we start with Davy on this one. Um, if a deputy under your watch were to observe a 14-year-old stealing a handful of candy bars from a convenience store, how would you want your deputy to handle that? Well, they need to know they're breaking the law, obviously. Uh, but do we want to ruin the life of a 14-year-old? No, not really. So I would expect a deputy under policy, because that's the first thing I would look at is departmental policy, because that's, that's what controls the actions of the deputy and make sure that appropriate response is, you know, given. Like, you don't tackle the kid in the parking lot because he stole a handful of candy bars and throw him in handcuffs in the back of your cruiser. So what, how the way I would want it handled is the way a parent would handle it if they caught their kid at Walmart, you know, pocketing something. Hey, you know, that's against the law. You know, we need to talk to your parents about this, and we're going to discuss this with your parents, you know, that, that kind of thing. We, we need to... We, our response in the law enforcement needs to, to be equivalent to what the issue is. Chair Blair? I, um, I wish that was the um, only thing we were dealing with with 14-year-olds in this uh -huh. society. I understand. Uh, I think uh, the appropriate action would be to um, respond to the call, speak to the, speak to the business owner, what their wishes would be. You know, if they, if they want to follow through with juvenile petitions, then... Uh, the deputy uh, would contact the, uh, uh, of course, the parent first uh, as a 14-year-old, if you can get a hold of the parent. And um, if not, the, uh, the human services would have to step in. But uh, then they would make a decision through the prosecutor's office whether or not juvenile petition would be filed and let it go through the course. And I think that would probably be the, the best course to, to try to get the juvenile's attention for something so minor, maybe take them through the system a little bit and show them that there's consequences to this. Um, it's, uh, it's something that, you know, I try to teach my kids when they were growing up. It's, even my four-year-old grandson says, I ask him when he does something wrong. Yeah, 
William, what's going to happen? He says, consequences, Papa. So he knows. Uh, and that's what we need to teach our children in society. There's consequences to everything. Stealing some candy bars, is that really the biggest you know, problem? Uh, I, I wish that was what we were dealing with in society with 14-year-olds. But uh, I think that would be the appropriate way to handle that. Final question before okay. closing statement. Uh, the sheriffs have always said we need more deputies. The county commission, county council says, well, we don't have enough money for it. What is the appropriate number of de- – excuse me. How do you determine the appropriate number of deputies? And I'll start with you, Sheriff. Thank you for that question, and it's a very good question. Uh, when I when I was appointed, I uh, came into this position, I was, I was very uh, encouraged. There's a big whiteboard in the hallway – of, um, of a uh, manpower chart that uh, was already been worked on by the county administrator and some of the county uh, uh, commissioners and, and, and the staff. And um, we are the second most populous county in, in the state of West Virginia, right behind Kanawha County. And I'm going to say within the next five years, we're going to be number one. We're sitting around 60 deputies right now. This manpower chart uh, is is slated for about 140 deputies. Now, that may sound a lot, but Kanawha County right now has over 100 deputies, and they're primarily uh, covered by municipalities. So they have 100 deputies. We're sitting at 60 right behind them. We're behind the eight ball right now. Um, we need to there's – a, there's a comparative uh, per thousand um, citizens to how many officers you, sh- you should have. We're way behind on that. We're probably about half of where we should be. I will say this, the county commissioners, um, uh, they're, they're great to work with, but they do have a budget. And uh, it, it's, it's really, um, you know, to sit here and, and say, I'm going to add 20 deputies. I've heard that. I'm adding 20 deputies. Well, how are you going to do that? Uh, I just went through a hiring process that was already underway when I took over. And I think we're going to probably get about two out of the, uh, I think, 14 that applied. It's a process. We're going to step into it again. And we're going to do a little better recruiting this next time. And uh, you know, let, let's see where it goes. But we need more deputies in Berkeley County. There is no, sit, sit out and listen to a radio one night and see how these deputies are responding to calls. They are busy. They're doing great work. I'm very proud to lead this organization. But we definitely do need more deputies. Thank you, Sheriff. M- Mr. Jones? Yeah, we, we definitely need more deputies uh, now because, you know, we have – shifts that need to be covered, right, 24-7, right? We're not going to wait for a deputy to come on duty to go check out a crime, right, and respond. So we need them, and the work's been done to see how many we possibly need. Here's the problem, man. We, the county commission has a budget, and we have to stick within that budget. But we send our taxes to Charleston. They're sitting on a billion-dollar rainy day fund down there. We need to be able to go down there and say, listen, you need to – to, uh, to pass some legislation and kick some of that money back up to counties that are growing and cannot provide adequate resources like law enforcement or EMS. Yeah. Excuse me a second. My, my question was what criteria do we use to determine the number of deputies? Well, because I'm not privy to, to the research that's been done, but it's already been done, and I think uh, Sheriff Blair said that it's been done before he was even taken office. That's, we go by that criteria. The go, criteria goes by how do we cover these shifts without massive overtime and burn out our deputies. So that's how we calculate how many deputies we would need. But once we've got that number, which it seems we already have, how are we going to pay for that? And that's how we would pay for that. They're sitting on a billion dollars. Our tax money goes down there. They decide how to divvy it up while we sit here and we struggle because we're one of the growing counties in the state. Bill and John, thank you for your questions. my name, can I? He, he did mention. Would you like a quick response, Rob? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, and he said that um, the um, uh, it was already underway the the, the manpower allotment, and uh, but how you're going to pay for that? There's a there was a one percent uh, uh, sales tax that was um, defeated in the legislature uh, this past uh, past session, and the cities can already charge that. Okay, so for some reason the counties can't, and I'm not advocating more taxes, but it seems like that would be a very good way to fund public safety. Uh, it doesn't affect food. Uh, food's not taxable. So uh, that 1% sales tax could be a big benefit to Berkeley County and uh, not only law enforcement, but also uh, emergency services. 
Thank you, Sheriff. We'll now move to closing statements. We'll begin with Davy Jones, the challenger, with the first closing statement. Mr. Jones, go right ahead. Uh, I'm Davy Jones. Uh, you can find out more about me because we obviously don't have enough time in these forums to discuss everything that we're about. Uh, my website is vote the number four davyjones.org, and you can find me on Facebook, Davy Jones for West Virginia. Uh, I have served either in the Army or as a reserve deputy, so I have, I have dedicated my life to service. I am a constitutionalist. Uh, a vote for me would be defending your constitution, and, uh, and you can expect that what I would do is to continue what I've been doing all my life, and that would be serving the people in the community. I thank you for your support. Sheriff Rob Blair. Thank you again for having us here to this morning. I think this is very uh, important that we do these type uh, debate forums, and I appreciate uh, you having us this morning. Um, I, like I said, I'm the only candidate with 35 plus years of law enforcement experience. I'm managing over 100 civilian uniform uh, personnel. I have uh, uh, deep roots here in the community. I'm the only candidate unanimously endorsed by the West Virginia Sheriff's Association and the West Virginia Deputy Sheriff's Association. Uh, um, I'm married to a, a lifelong resident of Berkeley County. I love this county. Uh, I want to see this county be the best it can be. And uh, I just uh, I asked the, the voters for their vote on May 14th. Um, I'm Rob Blair. It's Rob Blair for Sheriff on Instagram, Facebook, or my webpage. Thank you both. Davy Jones, Sheriff Rob Blair, much appreciated. Best of luck to you both in the upcoming election. Thank you. Thank you very much. We return with more with a look at the Berkeley County Commission race in the Adam Stephen District, H.D. Boyd and Stephen Grant in three minutes. Hi, Kresha Hornby here. Larry DeMarco, broker of Modern Realty Results, believes he has some of the best real estate agents in the Eastern Panhandle. Agents at Modern Realty Results have years of experience and knowledge of the local real estate market.